And verse 16, to what can I compare this generation? It is like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends. We played wedding songs and you didn't dance. We played funeral songs and you didn't mourn. For John did spend his time eating and drinking, and you say, he's possessed by a demon. The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard. Notice the negative in both of those remarks. And a friend of tax collectors and other sinners, but wisdom is shown to be right by its results. So here we have Jesus pointing out that uh, you accuse in this condition and you accuse in that condition. Why are you accusing? Why are you placing judgment here? And then we come to verse 20. Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of all their sins and turned to God. Now, he makes this statement and he points out, I'm going to denounce the town. Now, is that a blessing? No. Is it a cursing? Well, it would depend on the details. Or it could be a removal of blessing. It says, Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? Anybody remember why Bethsaida was special? It's where a handful of the disciples came from. Bethsaida means Fishington. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on judgment day than you. That is a very, very scary thing to receive. To be from a town, or know people from a town, and hear Jesus say that even these other people who had other problems would have turned and chosen and accepted their adoption into God's family. But no. You people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No. You'll go down to the place of the dead. Oh, I think I know what that's called. <laughs> for if the miracles I did for you had been done in wicked Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. Now, do we have a really negative picture of things at this point? Do we see what Jesus is really aiming at? He's aiming at truth and accepting it. He's aiming at truth and listening to it. He's aiming at a behavior that all who teach here talk about frequently, and it is accepting, picking up, and participating in the plan that God has put in the place. Now here's the thing we're going to focus on. Jesus offers a prayer up here. Remember, I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. And Jesus says this. At that time, Jesus prayed, prayed this prayer. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, think of it this way. Yes, Dad, it pleased you to do it this way. 
My father has entrusted everything to me, and no one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. May my, for my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. Now look at what Jesus talks about here in this brief prayer. He acknowledges his father, the creation, and for his father, putting certain physical knowledge in a place that is unavailable to just everyone. And he acknowledges the father choosing to reveal it to people who are childlike with childlike attitudes and disposition, dispositions. Um, he even says, and it pleased you to do it this way. Now, in acknowledging God and what God had chosen to do, when he points at God, his father, and says this, what is the message the disciples, those standing there, all the people are receiving? Someone in charge, someone with authority, someone who had a plan, someone who chose for something to be, and that someone made it that way. And then to go on, my father entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father. And no one truly knows the Father except the Son. Jesus here is pointing to his dad. And what he's doing is saying, I have this and it can be for you. Jesus is acknowledging. Now when a child gets saved, what I mean by that is they're about to fall off the ladder when they're trying to help dad paint, and dad catches them and saves them from hitting the ground. Is that child thankful that someone was there? Sure. They'd also be thankful if they hit the ground. I remember hitting the ground once as a little kid, knocking the wind out of myself, and I thought I was going to die. And I laid there and I was so glad that my dad was right alongside me. Because just holding his hand made me feel comfort and have some sense of it was going to be okay. And when I got up, my response was, thank you for saving me. And my dad looked at me and said, I didn't save you. I just comforted you. I didn't know what that was going to mean for 40 more years. But in this time, Jesus is pointing at and giving an example of acknowledgement that is a living, breathing thanks to the Creator, to His Father. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Is there a thought like that anywhere here in the United States written somewhere? Think of what's on the Statue of Liberty in the New York Harbor. Give me your tired, give me your weary and weak. That idea is common. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I, I am humble and gentle at heart and will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear and my burden I give you is light. Here's Jesus telling people about a, a solution to a problem, sin and death, a solution to a problem. You're being overrun, you're being used up, you're being spent, you're being ground up in this society. And I have another place for you to live in your heart and in your mind. 
Jesus is telling them there is goodness here and there is a plan, but he's also making sure that he acknowledges God's authority and God's action. Now, he goes on, and in the verses after this point, he continues to explain. But sometimes we as people are saying thanks when we acknowledge. Sometimes we're saying thanks when we acknowledge details, when we acknowledge generalities. You know, I stop and think about who we are here and the fortunate nature of our lives. We received the property in the church without paying a penny. We receive our jobs, our homes, the blessings that are around us. We receive the goodness that the country still has in offering food. Just like the pilgrims, we can find fruit and vegetables and corn and all that stuff in the stores. We don't have to tarry for it the way they did. But an attitude of thanksgiving is based upon what? What is present for an attitude of thanksgiving to exist? The giver? Gratitude. Gratitude. Now, are those ideas or are those facts? I think they're a little of both. Gratitude, which points at thankfulness. It points at gratefulness. The giver, which points at a fact. The it that gives. We sit in a place today in our society, in our lives, where a lot of people don't think thankfulness. They don't think thanksgiving. They don't think grateful. They think of what is relative and what is important to them in that single moment. Now we're gonna deviate for a few minutes here and we're going to look at our physical circumstance here. Has anybody in the last six months found they were thankful for something that went wrong or caused problems? Or was an issue that almost became a trial, that almost became a test? Curtis. Could you see the growth and the maturity before you entered into that time? Uh, I see that I wasn't appreciated and capable of that I did afterwards. So your experience educated you and gave you the reality of what change was there. Okay. We as people belonging to this family here, what things, I want us to come up with two things that New Hope members, residents, should be thankful for. Think, of, Phyllis. Well, the continued provision to that The continued provision for the outrage. Still, we have people who cannot utter a word when they find out we are two and a half hands full of people. They are dumbfounded because there are churches of hundreds that do not do what we do and they don't intermingle the way we intermingle. They're amazed by that. The continued provision, one person here, one person there, a family here, a family there. What else? should New Hope be thankful for? Pardon? The Indonesian church. Now specifically, why? They are our partner. 
Now, if I said we've been given charge of helping to nurture them and provide their needs so they could grow, would that be a true statement? Absolutely. Nancy. In the beginning, that was totally true. We, we would not be able to go where we need to go as a church without them. We could not do it financially or physically. Now, thinking spiritually as a Christian, I'm going to list off some things that I'm personally thankful for. I'm personally thankful for Miles, who came the other afternoon, and he worked on one of our generators and got a problem fixed that now makes the generator usable in a safe way. And I didn't have time to go do that by myself. And he did. And what I t really enjoyed was he didn't take no for an answer when I said not today. He re reiterated the words, I'm right around the corner. I'm going to be there in a couple of minutes. And that was a Holy Spirit moment when I understood the prompt to accept and receive and be thankful. So I acknowledge that because that will affect the whole family here, having that generator in the winter if things go bad. Another thing I'm thankful for, James Silicone, who had a very bad life and was a bad person many years ago, and who God reached out and plucked out of the social fabric and God put him in a position to receive knowledge. And now James lives for two things, to share what he has and help people, and to be sure to tell people about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. James is one of the more enthusiastic people that I have met in the last 10 years, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for God's infinite wisdom well above mine, I would even say well above ours, who knew where we needed to go and provided the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the hands, and the feet to get us there. He provided things to enrich us through individuals. Now, I can come up with a list that's huge of things Pastor Bill does that I am thankful and grateful for. The same is true for Nancy. But to put it in the short form, I'm grateful that they exist and that Bill and Nancy exist here, that this is our family and this is where they belong. I'm grateful for, for Diane. I'm grateful for Michelle's family and getting to meet them and know them because they live in a reality I don't. And that is something that encourages me deeply and it encourages me to continue to look and go forward when I meet somebody who's not me. That means so much to me. Now, I think of Dave and Barry. Dave has been a milepost of wisdom. Sometimes the wisdom was, wait, I'll tell you later. I'm going to go pray about it. Sometimes the wisdom, wisdom was, I have a knee-jerk reaction. It is this. I don't think we should. And sometimes it was, I think we should. And then Barry. Barry, who comes with an attitude, just like all the rest of us, I want to give, I want to share, I want to do. Everybody who comes here, I'm grateful for each and every one of the people here. For Deborah, who in a way was one of my first fruits here at New Hope, in my investment of time and energy and people, Deborah was the one that I noticed I went through the ritual actions and then I kind of stopped and forgot about things and all of a sudden God put her right back in front of me and I realized 
oh my, I now have a responsibility and an accountability. And Deborah is one of the people who behind the scenes when you least expect it will come up and say something that doesn't have spiritual words structuring it, but it means spiritual things holding it up. And she'll come and do that and that lifts my heart to no end. And I love a grandma who loves her kids and her grandkids. Each and every person here is a piece of the fabric of church, the capital C church, the God church, God family. In the same way that there are other church families, they each have their unique specialty, we'll call it. I'm thankful that St. Luke's and other churches around are willing to come to us with offerings and gifts, with grants, and help to support us and push us forward. But more importantly, I'm thankful of something that I only learned about three years ago. Do you know the Lutheran Church is the greatest church body in current history to preserve and teach and share the gospel of grace? No other church has taught it and pushed it into the community the way the Lutheran Church has. And I marvel that I didn't have the sense to recognize that. I didn't have the sense to see what God was doing. Does anybody else have something that is unique that they're thankful for? That was that God moment. It was part of that Holy Spirit thing. Eileen? Now, I'm going to ask a really honest question here that requires an honest answer. Do you think I could teach what Curtis teaches the way he teaches? No, no way. It's not part of my makeup. It is part of my desire. But it is through my brother that I see the attitude progress and pushed forward. I can't do what Nancy does. I can't do this much of what Nancy does. You guys don't see behind the scenes to see Nancy repetitively, persistently telling me, come on, we need to do this. Come on, we need to do that. You said I'm thankful for that kind of tenacity because it is what drives me ahead and keeps us moving forward. I'm thankful for many, many other things, but here's one in particular. I'm thankful that we do not yet have a $70,000 new roof, but yet God has allowed the stains in the ceiling to get no bigger, no more lights are burning out from the water, and we're not seeing water run out of the ceiling every Sunday during church. I'm thankful that we don't have that new roof, but yet God has provided for us in a very physical way to receive a blessing and a gift of no water on the floor. Belongs out there, not in here. Eileen. My prayer of late with the weather the way it has been, I said, Jesus, I know you heal people. I know you heal dogs, and I know you do all kinds of things to people. Ask. I'm asking you in your name to please heal our roof. That's what I ask you. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but hello, what did you do with the grape juice and turn it into what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yet we have learned provision is in the future. The question is, do we trust God's timing or do we want our timing? We have to trust. Our lives are based on that. 
Now we see in the examples in the Bible that the disciples questioned. They lived through challenges. They even fought one time over who was going to be in charge when the boss was gone. They didn't understand everything. Some of them even committed what some people think would be the ultimate sin, to speak against Christ and deny him. And yet, I am so thankful that Jesus didn't lose any of his trust in who Peter was, who became one of the cornerstone building blocks of the Christian church. I am so thankful that Jesus knew where to forgive and how to forgive in ways that I can't even imagine. In sharing, in blessing, in giving. Now, if you read through the Bible, you find that thanksgiving in the King James Version is about grateful love towards God and Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's the idea of Jesus. And it's the personage of God. But when you move to the New Living Translation in the NIV, it speaks closer to Jesus' heart. The thanksgiving in the New Testament relates to and is about person to person, people to people, from God. Now let me ask you a question. In a car accident and a family member, a dearly beloved mate, somebody dies. Did God put everything in place to come out of that trauma in that situation and survive and become rich spiritually in the heart and the mind again? Yeah, he did. God put everything in place that we touch and are touched by in the event of losing a loved one. But he also puts everything in place when a loved one has a close call and doesn't die, and we're thankful for that. The question is, are we willing to look past the situation to see what the future could be? Jesus promised what the future was. You come to me and ask. I'll take it to the Father. You come to me with that problem, and I'll take it to the Father. You come to me with that problem, and I took it to the cross. You come to me with that, that grateful response to your baby being born, and we already took that to the Father. Even in death, there are things to be thankful for. There are things to have grateful attitudes for. You know, I sit and think of what it was like for my best friend and my wife in 2000 to watch my heart stop and see me lay there dead for a minute and a half. That was not my choice. That was not my desire to have that happen, but it happened. Had it not, Eileen and I would not be here. We would not be with you today had it gone any different. One of the things I'm thankful for, which I wear every single day, if it were not for my medical problems, I would not be who I am. If God healed me and took away the problems I deal with, I would not have the mindset and be thankful and would not see that without the manna God gives me each day. Without that manna, I wouldn't make it. If I were well, better, healed, one thing would change. It would not be in my weakness, he is made strong. So I'm thankful that God knows where I need to be in here and in here. And I'm thankful that God knows how to keep me there. 
You know, not too many weeks ago, I had a pastor tell me that uh, he wanted to know what were the sins my mother and father created that keep me bound in the chains of medical problems. And I looked at him and I said, oh man, are you going to do an altar call and try to exercise me? And he looked at me and says, yeah, you need that. And I said, no, you need to read again what Paul wrote. In my weakness, he is strong. And it shows. Paul was saying that this place that I don't like, that I don't understand, that I don't choose to be in, even that is good for me. So when I sit here and I, I tell you guys about thankfulness, we live this week and have this holiday coming up Tuesday, and we celebrate it because of people who sought to leave the oppressed tyranny of a government and people who ruled religion locally as part of that government because of people who found freedom many years ago I see Thanksgiving in a physical context in a bread and water context in a blue sky and sea context but I also see Thanksgiving from their eyes Thank you for the savage people that were running around not killing us all. Thank you for providing corn that some of those people that weren't savage brought to us. Thank you for starting a new tradition with turkeys found in America. Thank you for starting to point at people that were your people and said it overtly and loudly, even if it cost them their life. Thank you for those people, God. Those people who came seeking freedom and found it here. You know, there are still a lot of unique things in America that don't exist any other place in the world. The freedom we have religiously is unprecedented. Now, one thing that I'm having trouble being thankful for is a new law that was passed in the city of Des Moines. They just ruled that it is against the law to serve a drug addict, serve an alcoholic, serve a homeless person, help a homeless person within a thousand feet of any school. And Federal Way is looking at that law. So I am going to be thankful in an optimistic manner knowing that everything that's here comes from an example in heaven and that the outcome to that so that problem what if the law is accepted here the outcome to that issue exists in heaven now it has already been dealt with and we have but to be thankful to wait and see what comes from that and how god uses that you know if if you read some ancient history about Daniel in the lion's den. The story we're taught in the Bible is not the story. It's not holistically true, nor is it encompassing everything that happened. When you read the historical documents about Daniel, what you see is Daniel said, oh really? You want to challenge me to show you the power of my God? Okay. Go put me in there. I'll go willingly. And Daniel walked and went out the door into the lion's den. It was not the idea of being captured and forced into that. Daniel was a person who was thankful for who he was and who his God was. And Daniel went and said, send me, let me be the one. Daniel exhibited thankfulness not spoken in the words thankful. But he was grateful for who his creator is and who he was made to be. And he exercised that thankfulness in that story for us. We sit at the edge of a time that can be good or bad for us and for people around us. 
You know, in what we read earlier, we're told the kingdom here on earth advanced forcibly. We're beginning to move to forcible forward movement in our minds and hearts here in this family. We're beginning to live and see and hear and be taught about forcible living, putting the example out there intentionally. Forcible living, that doesn't mean holding somebody's head underwater. What that means is we choose to live in the moment and to live completely connected to God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and be taken and pushed where we need to be. We accept that. We live that with thanksgiving. The Psalms, a lot of thanksgiving in there. A lot of thanksgiving in the Psalms. The wisdom in Proverbs, thanksgiving spoken without using the word thanks in many cases. Do you think Jesus was thanking his dad while he hung on the cross bleeding out? I don't think he had to. I think he was living the awareness. Thanks, Dad. I know you have this covered. Because he had seen the solution completed in heaven already and knew where that was going to go. Jesus was not only thankful in his life. There were times he had fear. There were times he had concern. There were times he had sorrow. But there also were times of joy and times of great reveling in thankfulness. I would imagine when we all stand in the heavens with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit around us in a way that we can perceive it every day, I think we are going to be amazed at the attitudes that are in the people from the stories we have read in the Bibles, in the different versions, in the def different delivery mechanisms. The one common thing is the greatness of God, his power through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So as we go forward through this week, don't forget that Thanksgiving is shown and is told sometimes without using the words thank you. Sometimes it is an acknowledgement. Sometimes it is an execution of something that pays attention to the original request that God made of us and that in that thankfulness are doing and are saying thank you God, sometimes silently, sometimes on our knees. That thankfulness is the acknowledgement that God knows Jesus did and is and the Holy Spirit does and is.